20% of people in the UK get 80% of their calories from ultra-processed foods. There is so much emotion linked to food. So we have, I would suggest, in this country, four possible ways of defining unhealthy food. What was the most shocking thing that you found when you were writing this book? It was going to Brazil and seeing the Nestle marketing effort in the Amazon. In very small villages, there'd be a number of children living with type 2 diabetes uh, under the age of 10. As a doctor, you get quite used to not being too emotionally involved with your patients, but I found myself in tears at several moments on that trip. Dr. Chris Van Teleken is an associate professor at the University College London and a practicing infectious diseases doctor. I've mm -hmm. been gaslit by my food. I can't lose the weight. If you are struggling with this food, it is food that has been engineered. You have no idea of the number of PhDs that have gone into this sandwich. Everything has been optimized to fiddle with your relationship with food and to get you to eat as much of it as possible. I'm so happy you use compassion there because I think many people might be feeling a lot of shame or maybe feeling scared how much they're consuming, might not be aware how much they're consuming. People should be furious about this. For someone who is listening, who is mm -hmm. feeling a addicted to this food. Mm. My proposal to them is... I'm your host, Sarah Ann Macklin, and I'm on a mission to uncover the maze of health myths around nutrition and well-being, and guide you through my seven pillars of health. Join me on a journey of discovery and connection, and pull up a pew for a front row seat to the most exclusive health conversations of our time. Welcome to Live Well, Be Well. If you've watched one episode and enjoyed it, I'd love to ask in agreement for you to subscribe to the show. Subscribing is such a small thing, but gives so much exposure, bringing bigger guests, bigger production, and more that we can deliver each week to more people. Every time you subscribe, it shows me that you enjoy the content. So if you do me a favor, and if you've enjoyed the show, please press subscribe. Chris Van Tallican. Welcome to Live Well Be Well. Thank you so much for being here today. It's such a treat to be here. I am, firstly, I've just said it, but massive congratulations oh. on this book, Process People. Stop it. Now, I mean, before we even get into it, the question that I wanted to ask is when you were writing this, I kind of obviously looked through a bit of your journey and you went on to an 80% ultra processed food diet when you were writing this book. Can you yes. tell me why? Well, we did it, the, the main reason was we did it, I did it with colleagues at UCL where I'm an mm -hmm. academic in the nutrition department and uh, we did it to create some pilot data for a big clinical trial that we're now running. Mm -hmm. um, so it wasn't done informally, it wasn't a sort of supersized me stunt, it was done mm. in quite a well-supervised, well-organized way and we collected a lot of data. In fact, I'm doing a presentation at a conference next week on it. Um, so it wasn't a stunt, and I was a bit sceptical when I started doing it. Mm -hmm. But the experience of going on the diet was sort of what catalyzed the book. So I, I didn't, when I was doing the diet, I didn't have a book contract. I wasn't all signed up and doing it for the book. So, um, okay. and, and the reason I, we picked 80% is because 20% of people in the UK get 80% of their calories from ultra processed food. So it's a very normal diet for. Uh, a teenager in this country. It's, mm -hmm. it's not an extreme diet. It's not mm. eating, you know, burgers, nothing but burgers. Yeah, so, for two what, was the, what was the diet like? Talk to us. So, someone's thinking, what is an 80%? Well, so, I was, it was a few diet. years ago. So, I was a, a uh, you know, I'm a, I'm a doctor and an academic in my, my early 40s, and I'd stopped eating, sort of obviously, fried chicken takeaways for dinner and mm -hmm. chocolate covered breakfast cereal. And I, I didn't have the snacks at work because there's just a moment in your early 40s as a man where you're like oh, I guess I've got to stop eating this and I've got kids at home so I was really excited to go on the diet I went on a washout period beforehand and then filled up the house with this food and but the point was not to stuff myself the point mm -hmm. was to eat to appetite which is mm -hmm. what I normally do I don't mm -hmm. I don't restrict my eating um but to not restrict what I eat so to eat what I feel like but 80 percent of the calories had to come from UPF and I guess there were there were three there were three kind of main physical effects. Massive weight gain. I gained so much weight that if I continued for a year, I would have doubled my body weight. So in one month, I gained uh, more than six kilos. Um, the second thing is we saw a change in my hormonal response to a meal. So the new obesity drugs have, have sort of revealed to lots of people that we have this hormone system inside our body that when we're hungry, we release hunger hormones, and when we're full, we release fullness hormones. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the diet, 
what we saw is that at the end of a standardized meal, mm -hmm. my hunger hormones stayed high and my fullness hormones didn't rise. So this this food was affecting my body's uh, relationship with fullness and appetite. We did brain scans then that I thought would be a complete waste of time because, you know, we expect kids have very malleable brains. But, mm. uh, you know, when you're in your 40s, your brain's sort of fixed. And it's not like I was taking illicit drugs for a month. Mm. I was just mm. eating normal food. We saw enormous changes in the connectivity between the habit forming automatic behavior bits at the back of the brain, the cerebellum and the reward addiction centers in the middle. And that that mirrored what I would say was an addicted relationship to the food. But mm. the, the biggest thing about the diet was about three quarters of the way through. I was speaking to a colleague in Brazil called Fernanda Rauba, and she kept saying to me every time I mentioned the food, she goes, not food. And I said, well, OK, Fernanda, and we, we keep talking. It was like a tick. It was really irritating. And um, she eventually went, it's not food. It is an industrially produced edible substance. And I hung up the phone call and I, I went to eat. In the book, actually, it's it's a turkey Twizzler. But in re for various reasons, when you're writing books, I'd already used uh, fried chicken. In reality, it was a fried chicken dinner. It was a takeaway. And I sat down to eat these these hot wings and I couldn't do it. And she had flicked this switch in my brain. So part of writing the book is um, for people who live with uh, an addict, have an addicted relationship to this food, mm -hmm. I am trying to give them what was given to me, which is uh, a, a lack of desire for it. And there's mm. there's a lot of evidence that this can be done with with cigarettes. Anyway, we we probably want to get into all the complexity around that. But that that was a sort of very big experience for me was I no longer want this food. How long was the diet for? Four weeks. Okay. And so you had that kind of flip of the switch. And how do you now feel when you eat ultra processed foods? So I do it to be polite because you find yourself because they're, they're so ubiquitous. Mm -hmm. You can seem weird if you um, what would be the scenario? We're filming, you know, I make a kid show on the BBC and we go out for dinner with the whole crew. Uh, right, uh, you know, or there's. You're <laughs> holding a, can we do brands here? Can we mention uh, yeah, you're holding up a, a popular? So for anyone not watching on YouTube, I am pulling out a handmade, everyday, tuna fish and cucumber pret sandwich. So this is uh, this was this would be an absolute staple of my diet mm -hmm. before. You know, I I work at a big hospital in London. There are you know three prets within within eyesight almost. Um, so I can't count the number of ingredients. I would guess looking at this label, there are more than 40 ingredients here, mm -hmm. including the uh, diacetyl tartaric acid esters of mono and diglycerides of fatty acids. And these, Explain for everyone So that's the emulsifier in the bread that makes almost all the bread we eat <clears throat> extremely soft and slimy when you swallow it and very, very easy to consume. You know, that's why we can mm. eat, we can all eat five sl slices of supermarket bread. So it's then, go I mean, it just goes on and on and on. Uh, so the, to dig, maybe I'll, why don't I come back? Yeah, to, let's come back to, to this. To this. Um, but the, the, the experience of being on the diet sort of radically transformed my relationship. And so now when I eat UPF, I really don't want it. Like, I can have this on the desk and it's like a pack of cigarettes. I simply do not, I don't want the cigarettes and I don't want the sandwich. Whereas previously it would have been an enormous distraction for me. Mm. Um, that wasn't my favorite pret sandwich. So I would say there's only, there's a couple of little sweeties that I still, I'd still, I can still imagine what they're like, mm -hmm. but I don't, I'm like an ex-smoker. Mm -hmm. You know, there's there's a process of recovery that you, you might once in a while at the pub have a cigarette, but... Mm -hmm. You know, I'm not, I, I'm not going to return to it. Mm -hmm. yeah. Recent studies in the UK have shown a concerning trend. Nearly a third of Britons suffer with insomnia or severe sleep disturbances. With stress, screens and sleep hygiene largely to blame. This isn't just about feeling groggy in the morning. The NHS has linked poor sleep with a high risk in chronic conditions such as heart disease, diabetes, obesity and not to mention the impact on poor mental health. That's why... I'm excited to share with you my experience with Naturomat, a company that truly understands the science of sleep. Crafted in Devon with its organic, renewable materials, Naturomat mattresses are a testament to what it means to sleep naturally. Unlike the common mattresses that trap heat and moisture, Naturomat's use of organic wool and coconut fiber ensures your body remains at a comfortable temperature throughout the night 
promoting a more deeper, restorative night's sleep. But what really sets Natural Mat apart is their commitment to sustainability. As the UK's first B Corp certified bed and mattress company, they're not just talking about environmental responsibility, they're living it. From their solar powered workshops to their groundbreaking Mattress for Life initiative, choosing Natural Mat is a choice for a healthier planet. I personally visited Natural Mat's showroom in Chiswick and I was amazed at their sleep zone. It's designed to give you a real sense of how their mattresses can transform your sleep. The calming ambience, the bespoke sleep aroma, and the privacy to truly relax and feel the difference. It's an experience that I would recommend to anyone who is serious about improving their sleep quality. For my UK listeners looking to transform their sleep and by extension their health, I encourage you to visit naturalmat.co.uk. And don't forget, being a Live Well Be Well listener, you can get 10% off your first order using the code LIVEWELL. Invest in your sleep, your health, and your planet with Natural Mat. And I really want to get into the actually food addiction because that's a very kind of complicated term, I think. Some people agree with it, some people don't. Um, but before we get into that, let's just start on the basics because I actually, I actually said to my dad um, before I came here, I said, do you have any questions around ultra-processed foods? Um, and he was previously a type 2 diabetic before I got involved and drastically tried to change his diet. But he's still quite confused, I think, in this yeah. area. And so he said, well, w well, you know, so my dad was, was previously a type 2 diabetic and then I kind of stood in and we managed to reverse that, which was amazing. But he still finds this navigation around ultra processed foods, I think, really confusing. So when I asked him the question, he said, well, um, well, and I think he felt quite embarrassed. Well, what exactly is ultra processed food? Ham, you know, um, is cheese. Um, and I actually said supermarket bread and he couldn't quite get his head around it so let's maybe start the with the working definition if you go to the united nations food and agriculture mm -hmm. website they house the definition now it's very long it's nine paragraphs long oh my gosh so how no can one anyone can, understand that no one can commit it to memory hardly anyone's ever read it but the working definition if you want to tell as a consumer you simply look at the ingredients list and if there is something like an emulsifier or a colouring, or a flavouring, even a natural flavouring, these are ingredients you don't have in your kitchen at mm -hmm. home. If it's got one of those ingredients that you don't find in a typical kitchen, it's almost certainly an ultra-processed food. Mm -hmm. That's how you tell. Mm -hmm. And actually, what we know is once people get their head around that tool, just mm -hmm. read the ingredients list, they find it pretty easy. Now, there are a few little exceptions. So if we look at the, 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 the flour ingredients, by law, flour has to, be, have, um, has to have calcium carbonate, uh, niacin and thiamine and iron added to it. It has mm -hmm. to be fortified. Like the B vitamins. So yeah. th those things don't make it ultra processed. So mm -hmm. any flour that you, you have in the UK will mm -hmm. have that. Um, but in general, if you find a funky ingredient, it's probably ultra processed. If you're reading an ingredients list, mm. it's probably ultra processed. The mm. way of thinking about the food really is to ask the question, when this food was made, what was its purpose? Was it constructed by someone who loves me and cares about me, who wants to help me with my type 2 diabetes? Or was it made, in this case, by a very large German conglomerate, mm. which has as its coffee arm Pret, but which has a vast range of other uh, investments. So it's owned, Pret's owned by a thing called JAB Holdings. It's a huge mm. German private conglomerate company. And JB Holdings has to deliver financial growth to uh, owners of the company. And that's mm -hmm. what all the food companies have to do. Mm -hmm. So when a food company, when the primary purpose of the company making your food is to deliver money to owners, mm -hmm. big institutional investors, pension funds, hedge funds, mm -hmm. they're going to prioritize that money over your health. Mm -hmm. And so that's the question. So the, the, there is this loophole with UPF that's really important also to understand. Companies like Pret, Marks and Spencer, Waitrose, many of the supermarkets are now cleaning up their labels. So they've, you know, my book has sold well and I go and speak to food companies. I never take their money. But they're all now trying to get the weird emulsifiers and the flavorings off their labels and replace modified cornstarch with plain old cornstarch, which you might have in a kitchen. Now, if you take the weird ingredients out of this sandwich and reformulate it, the chefs at Pret can make something that's equally delicious, equally calorific, and will drive an equal amount of excess consumption. So 
Uh, that stuff is clean label UPF and it needs to be carefully regulated. So mm. you have to be. That's why I think the the definition about uh, about the size of the company and the purpose of the food is is really important because mm. we get we're going to if you go and buy a ready meal lasagna, most of the time actually it hasn't got any additives, but it will still have very high levels of sugar, salt, saturated fat, and mm -hmm. extremely high calorie density. Because I'm thinking as you're talking about this, so many people relating to. Thinking about reading a label will read a traffic light system. Right. So there's that traffic light system that yeah. came in, as in green is great, you can have as much as you mm. want. Amber is, you know, in moderation, and red is very little and often. Mm. And I think that's how most people, when they go into a supermarket, shop and they think, well, this is good, this is good, this is good. Yeah, I What's mean, your it, thoughts it, it, on that? Because we're talking well, about lights, the I mean, I back talk... of ingredients, which is different to a traffic light system. So I can talk endlessly about this because I've just testified in the House of Lords <laughs> about this. So we have, I would suggest, in this country, four possible ways of defining unhealthy food. So mm -hmm. one is the traffic light system. Now, that is a voluntary system. It's not based on our nutritional guidance. And each um, packaged food can mm -hmm. have up to four traffic lights for uh, 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 saturated fat, um, fiber, salt, and sugar. Mm -hmm. And um, so you get things like Cocoa Pops, for example, has two oranges and two greens. Now, it's not clear to me what you should do at an orange and green traffic light. Mm -hmm. It's also not entirely clear how that relates to portion size. The, the recommended portion size of a bowl of, co of Cocoa Pops is about one small handful. Mm. And if we used the UK dietary guidance to put the traffic lights on the package, they'd all be, uh, the, all, the, many of them would turn red for Cocoa Pops. Mm -hmm. So the traffic light system is very weird. We have good evidence it doesn't work. It doesn't shift consumer behavior away from unhealthy food. It's set using the wrong thresholds. Um, and it's arbitrary. And it's voluntarily adopted by companies like Coke. So you'll notice a Diet Coke has four green traffic lights. That's it's what I was thinking. the healthiest thing you can buy. Mm -hmm. a, a, a sugary Coke has three green traffic lights. It's, an it's got one red for sugar, but it's otherwise got three greens. A, d a Coke is an incredibly healthy drink, but it's three quarters healthy by the traffic light system. Mm -hmm. And there's no sense of dosage. You know, how, mm. In fact, a, a little bottle of Coke is two recommended servings, mm. which no one would ever do. Mm. So traffic lights are very problematic. Um, we've got UK dietary guidance, which is uh, written in tables on the web, and you have to go and dig it out, and it's not mm. usable for consumers. Mm. We've got this thing called high fat salt sugar, Mm -hmm. which is the way that um, intuitively you'd think it's a measurement of the amount of fat, salt and sugar. It isn't. It's a complex formula that you get points for fat, salt and sugar, and then you subtract points for beneficial things like fiber and protein, and you put it all through a formula and you only apply it to certain foods. And that guides whether you can advertise the food on television to children. Okay. So that's completely opaque to consumers. Mm -hmm. You it would be very hard for you to find out for lots of products whether it is technically HFFS. You could HFSS. You couldn't do it for this. And then the final thing is UPF. So UPF is really simple. If it's got a weird ingredient, it's probably UPF, and everything else is more or less fine. Mm. So when you were writing this, I just want to know what was the most shocking thing that you found or that surprised you when you were writing this book. I think my my. My journey with this book really started a very long time ago when I was a young doctor working in Central Africa and in South Asia and Pakistan. And uh, I'm an infectious diseases specialist mm -hmm. and I saw lots of kids die of infections. And we couldn't save their lives, no matter how many antibiotics we had, because the reason they were dying of diarrhea was because they were being marketed baby food that their parents couldn't afford. They didn't have clean bottles to make it up uh, and, and they couldn't make it up with clean water. That mm -hmm. was the most important thing. And those were the same companies now that, that, that I saw doing that, that now make all of our food. Um, so it was going to Brazil and seeing the Nestle marketing effort in the Amazon that was probably the most upsetting part of writing the book. So Nestle had a very, very incredible marketing campaign where they created a floating supermarket full of ice cream and Kit Kats and treats and they floated it uh, hundreds of kilometers into the Amazon jungle up the Amazon River going to very very remote communities and creating a market for um, products that simply didn't exist there um, and the ship ran for a few years did a brilliant job created this incredible uh, epidemic of diet related disease and then Nestle have sensibly closed it down once everyone got outraged but I went to Brazil 
and went to some of the communities where, um, you know, in, in very small villages, there'd be a number of children living with type 2 diabetes uh, under the age of 10. I mean, even in London, we don't see this. Mm -hmm. So um, I think, you know, you don't often get, as a doctor, you get quite used to not being too emotionally involved with your patients. But mm -hmm. I found myself in tears at several moments on, on that trip. So that was probably the most shocking. Mm. Well, that's because it's kind of bled into the hands. I remember studying. I, I wish I can remember the name of the island that it affected, but it's when, I think it was something in the 80s where Coca-Cola had bought Coke to this quite indigenous island. And within 10 years, everyone was struggling with obesity. Yeah, so the Pacific Islands um, mm, might have, been that have, one. have really, really, really struggled, all of them, with the Western diet. I mean, mm -hmm. the definition of ultra-processed food is really just a way of describing an American diet. Mm -hmm. And it's the American diet that we've adopted in the UK. So we, whether it's the, the, the bread or the fast food pizzas, the industrialization of our food, where its purpose is profit, that comes from America. And it's the only diet we've ever studied that is clearly linked to negative health outcomes, the only dietary pattern. Mm -hmm. So, you know, you can go anywhere in the world. You can look at vegan diets from South Asia, pescatarian diets from East Asia, mm -hmm. sea mammal diets in, in the high Arctic I've studied. Mm -hmm. um, anywhere you go, traditional French diets of red wine, cheese, um, the Mediterranean diet, mm -hmm. all of them are linked to good health. Mm -hmm. The only diet that we see linked to terrible health outcomes is modern industrial food. And that's that's what the definition of UPF was created to try and study. And is it one in five people get 80% of their calories from UPF? It's around 20, yeah, 20% 20 of the UK population. It's probably a bit higher than that now. <clears throat> and in kids, it's higher than that. So this is a it's a pretty normal diet for a UK teenager. And that's it's a, we, we eat about the same proportion as Americans, Canadians, Australians. Uh, and countries with lower rates of diet-related disease eat much less. Mm -hmm. And we see not just that this food drives a pandemic of weight gain. So its most obvious effect is the best way to make money from food if you're a food company is to use the cheapest possible ingredients and make your food as addictive or quasi-addictive as you possibly can. That's mm -hmm. the only way you can make money. Mm -hmm. um, what we see is that it therefore drives weight gain because it's engineered to get around your fullness mechanisms. Mm -hmm. But we also see it's associated with lots of other problems. So it's got very clear links to dementia, anxiety, depression, uh, cancers, especially gastrointestinal cancers, mm -hmm. uh, inflammatory disease, um, metabolic disease, cardiovascular disease, brain disease, uh, cerebrovascular disease. So it's, it's got lots and lots of very strong links to all these problems. Mm -hmm. And one of the clearest manifestations of that is stunting in UK children. So if you look at a class of UK five-year-olds, um, I've got a I've got a six-year-old, if you take a class of UK five-year-olds and you put them in Norway next to a class of their peers, the children, the, UK, the British children will be that much shorter, you know, eight or nine wow, centimetres at, at the age of five. Um, and this is really good. This isn't, you know, uh, uh, muddled up data. This is a, a big Lancet review that was done on, on child height. And this has nothing to do with different genetic populations coming to the UK. Mm. That's all been adjusted for. It's it nearly entirely down to diet. Mm -hmm. So what we see is a crisis of um, malnutrition as well as excessive calories. And th mm. those two things go hand in hand. You can be malnourished, but also gain weight. I think that's what really confuses people, that actually they're thinking they're eating a lot, but they're not eating enough nutrients because it's all right. processed food. So right. they are malnourished. And I think right. a lot of people think about male nourishment with eating disorders or anorexia nervosa or those type of things or you know if you're in where you were in Africa thinking about people that were starving but actually obesity can be really really similar something that I think is I see a lot in my clinic and I get quite upset is kind of the misled marketing around some ultra processed foods so Many people might be able to name, you know, ham as an ultra processed food and bacon as an ultra ultra processed food. But then you've got these kind of like healthy cereal bars sat mm. out or, a, you know, a protein shake that looks quite healthy, or a healthy protein bar that if you have this, it's a great snack to have in your day. And a lot of people can be quite misled into this kind of narrative of, well, is that an ultra processed food or is it not an ultra processed food? Yeah. So there's, there's a big discussion around are there any healthy ultra processed foods? And the discussion is entirely generated, nearly entirely generated by the food industry that makes mm -hmm. them. So it's a discussion that's uh, promoted by uh, entities like the British Nutrition Foundation, which is funded by companies like and including Coca-Cola, McDonald's and so on. Um, so 
it's possible. There's certainly a spectrum of harmful ultra processed foods. Um, but I think the debate gets really complicated because when you're eating very cheap ice cream that has really only sugar as the the, the uh, sugar is the only ingredient that you might have in a kitchen, at least you know what you're getting into, and you mm. may choose to not have it all that often. The problem with the foods that are posing it as <clears throat> as healthy, whether it's an organic sandwich, whether it's a, a cereal bar, is that you eat them thinking they are a form of medicine or that they're good for you. And so mm -hmm. I, I think there's a real kind of moral hazard with those foods. Mm -hmm. um, the evidence doesn't apply to individual products. Mm -hmm. The evidence is saying a dietary pattern based on ultra processed foods, as we do in the UK, mm -hmm. that's what's harmful. And so because the foods we eat the most of are, for example, the supermarket bread, the evidence is pretty clear that it's it's products like the breads and the cereals that are marketed as healthy that are probably driving the problem. If you look at a box of Cocoa Pops, the last one I looked at had 12 separate health claims on it. Okay, Added vitamin D, added iron, supports the health of your entire family, some of the boxes say. Uh, and on and on. Source of fiber, uh, you know, there's, there are claims about it being having less sugar than other brands, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. So it's when Cocoa Pops is sold to us as a health food, it, that should indicate to us really that we're failing to regulate this industry. Mm -hmm. And something you spoke about, which I find really fascinating, and you said we're going to get into this, but it's, it's food addiction. Yeah. And so many people might be shocked to think that they could get addicted to ultra processed foods. Other people might not be shocked and might feel that very strongly that they can't kind of get off this roller coaster. They need that dopamine hit, that serotonin kind of uplift that they get when they have ultra processed foods. Can you talk about a little bit about that? Like, how is this addictive and what is it doing to our brains? So there was a politician the other day on uh, on on a, on a radio chat show who said, you know, are you uh, the, 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 the journalist said, are you going to regulate food like you are tobacco? And, and she said, no, no, we won't, because it, it doesn't act like tobacco. You know, when you see people who've had amputations because of smoking, continuing to smoke, uh, we can show that tobacco is addictive. But you don't see that with food. In fact, if you go to the diabetic ward at any hospital, you will see, pull, see people with diet-induced type 2 diabetes having amputations and being unable to stop eating the food that's driving the diet-related disease, the, the metabolic syndrome causing the vascular problems. So we have very, very good evidence that food addiction does exist. Mm -hmm. But really, the, the evidence shows that people only become addicted to ultra-processed food. Al almost we have no data at all that people become addicted to food that's made by people that love them, people that food that people cook themselves at home. Mm -hmm. And for a long time, science has struggled really with two two problems about food addiction, which which are very real. The first in food first is that food doesn't contain addictive molecules. Mm. So some people say that sugar's addictive, but we could we, we could have a bowl of sugar on the table. No one eats sugar with a spoonful, mm -hmm. right? We don't mm -hmm. generally eat honey straight from the jar. Mm. So people aren't addicted to, to sugar. Fat, similarly, we don't eat butter with a spoon, most mm -hmm. people. But what we see is it's possible to bring ingredients together into formulations that people do become addicted to. Then the problem becomes uh, that baked into the notion of addiction is a problem of abstinence. People can't be abstinent from food. And so declaring food to be addictive is, is a really legitimate problem. What it turns out is if you say that ultra processed food is the only thing that people become addicted to, it sort of solves that problem. Now, in functional terms, UPF is the only food that many people can afford that's available to them. Mm -hmm. But at least theoretically, it is all discretionary. It didn't exist for most people 50, 60 years ago. Mm -hmm. You don't have to eat any of it other than for social and economic reasons. So mm -hmm. you don't need it physiologically. Mm -hmm. So it does solve that problem. And we've got very, very good data. I mean, the definition of addiction is pretty straightforward. Mm. Okay, We don't diagnose people with addiction by taking blood or putting them in a brain scanner. We ask them a set of questions. And the questions all revolve around the idea of, do you continue to use a substance despite wanting to stop using it? Mm -hmm. Do you use it in increasing dosages? Mm -hmm. And do you use it despite knowing it does you physical, social, or psychological harm? Mm -hmm. And if the answer to those questions is yes, then you probably have an addicted relationship. Mm -hmm. So I, I think... We've got population data. We've got experimental data. Um, I, I think food addiction is very real. And I say that with some degree of lived experience. You know, mm -hmm. I think I, I have lived with a real addiction to these these products. And when did you kind of feel that you had an addiction to them through the research and go, oh, my gosh, this is... It was, I think, I mean, this is a ticklish thing to, to talk about. And it, this may be somewhat 
triggering for some people. And I, I'm conscious that I say this as a, as, a, as, a, as a man with some privilege. But I think for many years, it was there was no great shame as a sort of bloke at a healthy weight to go and absolutely binge on stuff and, and make myself sick. And I've, I've mm. talked about this and my, my brothers and I would all do this. Um, and it never struck me as particularly disordered. It was a way mm. of solving the problem of massive overeating. And mm -hmm. it wasn't happening every day, but it might be every couple of weeks. And I think it was when I was suddenly released from the spell during uh, the experiment where I was I was eating the UPF to excess that I suddenly went, oh, I really have been addicted. When I stopped craving it, that's that's when I kind of I kind of knew. Wow. And so that, well, from what I'm hearing, is bulimia. That was kind of happening, but maybe yeah. not to an extent of it's, doing it's it every very, day. It's very tricky because, of course, the definition of a, of a disorder has to include harm. And I wasn't necessarily being harmed by it. And, and also the motivation to do it was not about weight regulation or psychological control it was much more uh i i would just eat five thousand calories and be unable to sleep so i sort of make myself sick mm. for a practical reason but it was my wife who said you know that i mean I, I can go around in circles with it in the end my wife and my brother's wife said this is not a normal relationship with mm -hmm. food mm -hmm. and once you start to meet a community of people who are also affected then you realize oh, i mean addicts always have ways of justifying their Mm -hmm. their behaviours. Mm -hmm. So I, I now have done some work and continue to do some work with the Royal College of Psychiatrists Eating mm -hmm. Disorders faculty because the, the, the hazard of this book, all the way through writing it, I was very aware that I, I'm treading this knife edge where I, there's a group of readers who feel addicted to this that I actually want to slightly disgust with this food because that's what was given to me and it's, mm -hmm. been, it's been like a, like a, a gift not mm -hmm. wanting the food. At the same time, I don't want to stigmatise anyone, the, the, the millions of people who depend on this mm -hmm. and make them feel shame. And I certainly don't want to generate any eating disorders. Mm -hmm. Now, so I went and spoke to Agnes Aiton, who's the, the, the chair of that faculty at the Royal College. And they have early data that really, when it comes to binge eating disorders and a lot of disordered eating, they feel that ultra processed food may be the driver of the disorders. And this is something that B. Wilson, who's a, oh, yeah. a noted food journalist, has also written about. Um, if you create food that is engineered to disrupt your relationship with food, to drive excessive consumption, food that contains neurotransmitters, food that affects your microbiome, that affects your brain in odd ways, perhaps it is the food that is part of the engine of the pandemic of eating disorders that we're seeing in young people. Now, eating disorders are very specific. There's a lot we, we don't understand. Mm. But I think I'm much more at ease going, this is food worthy of critique provided it's done with compassion mm, um, and and done done with a with an awareness that mm -hmm. when we critique food we critique the people who eat it and mm -hmm. the communities that eat it and and so we have to be just hyper aware this is this is food for people who live uh, whilst we all eat an amount of it it is food that is forced on people who live in disadvantage and and particularly children I'm so happy you use compassion there because I think maybe listening to this and I want to highlight it now many people might be feeling a lot of shame or maybe feeling scared how much they're consuming might not be aware how much they're consuming it's quite a big thing and I think I I know that a lot of people can eat larger quantities of ultra processed foods than whole foods and can you explain why and is there any kind of like scientific data that shows this on how much more we might consume because that's also a huge other trigger for people to stop eating as you said you were overeating and then you wanted to be sick because you could consume this amount of food because so, it was ultra processed. So it's, I'm so pleased you've said that. You know, I did a lot of publicity around the book and I, I was quite good at always putting in these caveats. And then you you reach a sort of familiarity with it all and you think, well, everyone's heard me say that. But I think it's really important to say to people who are listening, if you are struggling with this food, it is it is food that has been engineered by you you have no idea of the number of phds that have gone into this sandwich mm -hmm. into to every single one of the ingredients the way they're put together the packaging the smell everything has been optimized to fiddle with your relationship with food and to get you to eat as much of it as possible that's why when you eat this sandwich you never leave a quarter i mean this mm -hmm. sandwich has how many calories in per Pack on my, my eyesight, energy, KCAL. Can you see how many calories per pack? 
So per pack, you've got, oh, wow. How much um, is it? 862. That's what I thought it said. But then I was like, really? I think, I think you're right. I mean, that just feels... That ridiculous. feels mad, doesn't it? No, it's 370. It's 370. They're, they're doing jewels and oh. colours. I mean, they're making this very hard. <laughs> the two of us. I mean, we know something about nutrition. Okay, so it's three, 370. Now, there are lots if of... anyone else is confused, we're both there, there are, there are, And also, just, we all need glasses. So, so there are lots of sandwiches in Pret that are over 500 calories. Yep. You will never, ever leave a quarter of a sandwich behind. Mm -hmm. You will be licking out mm -hmm. every single last mm -hmm. crumb. And that's because it's d been designed. So if you're struggling with the food, the sort of strap line of the book is, it isn't you, it's the food. So how does it do it? What's the yeah. mechanism? We actually understand quite a lot about how the food does this. Mm -hmm. And we've got really good studies going back to the 90s that when food is soft and when it's energy dense, mm -hmm. that those are two really important properties to drive excess consumption. So ultra processed food, simply because it has been so physically mangled, chemically, thermally and physically, it's been actually processed very small particle size um this this sandwich feels like it's got a bit of texture but I, you can compare this to if you made this with rye bread mm. and chunks of tuna and bigger bits of cucumber you know it'd take you twice as long to eat that's a good point actually the the energy density is mm. partly because the food is dry now there is some illusions of moisture in a lot of the products that comes from uh, using using sugars and oils but it's generally bone dry because water is expensive to ship around mm -hmm. and um, uh, water reduces shelf life so mm -hmm. what you want is very very dry food so the food has a nearly infinite shelf life mm -hmm. what you want is to be able to make your um, uh, mince pie say in February for next Christmas because it's going to take the factory a long time to make you know the mm. 20 million that you need to produce so the energy density and the softness mean you consume calories, just you swallow them at a rate that your body has not evolved to keep up with. Real food, even a fatty marbled steak, A, you have to cut it and chew it, and B, steaks are full of water. They're actually quite low energy density, even mm -hmm. if they're very fatty. So um, the second thing is... Uh, uh, think the food tells you a series of lies. Mm. So whether it's the non-nutritive sweeteners or the flavor enhancers or the gums replacing the fat, there are lots of things that uh, signals arrive in your mouth that then the nutrition doesn't deliver. So we understand this best with the, the artificial sweeteners or the non-nutritive sweeteners. It doesn't matter if they're natural. You don't taste sweet in your mouth, right? You don't have sweet detectors on your tongue because it's fun. Yeah. You have it to signal to the inside of your body organs like your pancreas, that refined sugar is on its way. And mm -hmm. so you better release insulin and other hormones to deal with the refined sugar. Mm -hmm. And this is why we have a sweet taste, because humans are quite good at eating sugar. Mm -hmm. Now, um, if you put sweet taste on the tongue and the sugar never arrives, we used to think that would then boost your insulin, lower your blood sugar, and then you'd, you'd eat more sugar elsewhere. So if mm -hmm. you're drinking a diet cola, you'd eat more fries. Mm -hmm. It seems from a really big paper published last summer, most of the artificial sweeteners put your blood sugar up. So we think this is part of a stress response. If, you're, if you put sweet on the tongue and the sugar never arrives, this is incredibly confusing for your body. For millions of years, if you put sweet, sweet taste on the tongue, sugar then arrives in the body, honey or, or, or whatever. So... Um, the lies seem to be important. Mm. Uh, flavoring, coloring, marketing is a big part Cute. of excess consumption. Mm -hmm. But it's not so much about any one of the ingredients or properties. It's the, the whole gestalt, the entire, um, ev every single aspect of the food has been optimized. So you can't really tease it apart. It's like going, you know, why are we all addicted to our phones? Is it, are you addicted to your phone because of its camera or its the apps or is it the sleek feel or the buttons or the swipey it's the ping of a it's, message what, the dopamine it, hit right, that you get like, but it's all of it isn't yeah. it it's every aspect mm. is just designed from the acoustic of the ping to your relationship with the brand so you can't tease it apart and mm -hmm. that, that's a really important thing for understanding why you can't really reformulate ultra processed food mm. so we we see this the best example is with a diet cola i mean diet cola is like the ultimate solution isn't it it's it's a perfect fix. They're basically indistinguishable, zero calories. Why aren't diet drinks solving at least the proportion of the obesity epidemic that's due to soft drinks? They're just not. And we've massively increased our consumption. The non-nutritive sweeteners are probably a bit better than sugar. I mean, mm. I, 
you know, my colleagues who I really trust w- would all say that. I, I'm I'm a bit on the fence about it, but they're probably not much worse. Mm-hmm. Um, and yet they they really aren't solving the problem. So even the best reformulation doesn't doesn't work. That's why we we think that to change population health, we have to switch people away from an industrial diet back to sort of eating real food, traditional food. But you just said a really good thing that made me think willpower because a lot of people go through this cycle right everything that you're just explaining kind of negates the willpower because actually it's very hard to have any type of willpower when we're drawn in to will, everything the will, i'm so pleased you bring this up about. like the willpower argument willpower has been the sort of the pillar mm-hmm. i mean frank you know i've spent i've been broadcasting on the bbc for more than 15 years mm-hmm. and many many years i did programs about weight loss so i did mm-hmm. a program called what's the right diet for you and we, this is, can you imagine this? We got like 100 volunteers. We weighed them all at the beginning. We weighed them all at the end. And then we set, we had a sort of cheer because they'd lost like collectively several hundred kilos. And it was, it was the kind of celebration of weight loss. It was fetishizing a particular kind of body. And it was telling the audience that if only they had this information, they could make the choices that would help them lose weight. Now, what we know now is that and, and this is this is painful to say. Without specialist intervention, mm. if you live with obesity, mm. it is a, nearly an incurable condition for many people. That's mm. why these drugs are, in some ways, a, a blessing. That's why we need to change the food environment. But it, and pe- everyone listening who's ever tried to lose weight will will there are a small number of people who have the resources and the motivation the, the the external motivations that kind of force them to do it but basically mm. for many people it's an immovable object so w- willpower arguments are dead buried they are scientifically economically morally and uh, uh socially functionless they're they're, they're wrong and mm-hmm. this has nothing to do with willpower i'm so pleased that you said that because this, there is so much as well emotion linked to food and i think so many people beat themselves up trying to go on a diet that doesn't make them feel great, doesn't kind of give them any rush that you're talking about and you might eat an ultra-processed food. And then what they might say is that they relapse. And it, it feels a very shameful area. But when most of our supermarket shelves, I think it's like three quarters, are full of ultra-processed foods. It's quite That's a painful... That's how supermarkets make their quite money. a painful environment, though, for somebody who is trying. Imagine being a smoker in the 1960s. Yeah. And you're struggling. You want to quit. You started to cough. You've got a feeling it probably is the cigarettes. But everyone, you and I would be sitting here smoking. The techs would be smoking there. There'd be an ad break for a cigarette company. There'd be cigarettes outside. It'd be impossible for you. And, yeah, yeah, and it's, yeah. the, it's the same the same relationship. So, um, yeah, I, it, it feels very obvious to me. That the, I mean, the one thing I say in the book, I, I really... There are two really important things I think it's worth explicitly saying that I have no opinion on how anyone should live. You can live with excess weight and actually be perfectly healthy. Mm. I don't think that people should lose weight. Um, the book is not written to help anyone lose weight. Um, I don't even think as a population everyone should lose weight. I think if we shifted to a healthier diet, in fact, you know, living at a lower weight would be one of the uh, smaller benefits. You yeah, And... What's really important for people listening who live at what we, in a horrible way, call a healthy weight is if you're eating a diet high in ultra-processed foods, even if you don't gain weight, you're still exposed to all the increased risks of dementia, anxiety, depression, inflammatory mm-hmm. bowel disease, and on and on and on. So mm-hmm. it's th- this is not a discussion that's about weight. And I think resting diet-related disease away from an obesity discussion is, is really important. And you do that very, very kind of skillfully. Thank you. I think people will also ask in this in this conversation one really big thing that I always like to bring up because I think exercise is fantastic for mental health. I mm. think it's great for getting you out. I think running outdoors into nature brilliant. It is amazing. Yep. It makes you feel brilliant. But you can't outrun a bad diet. And I really believe that it's not equal that we do need to understand our is, diet you, you, and exercise. So you are so right. So it may maybe this. So I talked about you know my horrible trip up the Amazon. In a way, the chapter I most enjoyed writing was the one about exercise because I I started writing this book, and the subject that brings the, the reason that brings people to this this subject is for many people is living with ex- excess weight, mm-hmm. the shame and suffering, physical mm-hmm. and psychological mm-hmm. that that causes, and. Um, 
So I was curious when it comes to the discussion of obesity, and there is a discussion of that in the book, when we talk about weight, how much, when we talk about food, how much of the problem are we representing? And mm -hmm. I think when I started writing the book, I'm like, well, it's probably about 50-50 because -50, we do all sit around and play computer games and watch TV. And I found these articles that really hard pushed the idea that most of the problem of obesity is because we are sedentary. Mm -hmm. And um, perhaps the most gratifying bit of the book was to reveal that that entire section of the scientific literature uh, and I really mean like thousands of papers was funded by Coca-Cola and the institutes that they set up and the university departments they fund and the scientists they give money to. Um, and at the same time, we have some brilliant signs going back mm -hmm. to the 90s, um, but kind of drawn together in 2012, 2014 by a guy called Herman Ponser, but um, uh, Amy Luke uh, and, and some other brilliant scientists have sort of backed this up. Um, that when we do exercise, it doesn't change over the course of a year the number of calories we burn very mm. much. So if you are an Olympic rower or an Arctic explorer, of course it does. Mm -hmm. But for most of us going to the gym two, three times a week, it doesn't change the number of calories you burn. What it seems to be the case is the reason exercise is good for you is because you steal energy from other budgets. So, so I have a pretty sedentary life at the moment. I've got... Um, uh, you know, young children, I just can't fit in exercise. But I still burn about 3,000 calories a day. And I spend those 3,000 cal calories on anxiety, on inflammation, on horm high hormone levels. Mm -hmm. Now, when you start doing exercise, you take energy away from your anxiety budget, from your inflammation budget. And we think that's why it's good for you. So it's it's a... It's the most elegant chapter in the book, I think, because it's it's in narrative terms. It's like, yeah, this thing that you all believe, it's completely wrong. It was all funded by Coke. Here's some better science. There you go. And now let's get on with the story about the food. So I was, it's, uh, I'm boasting now. But anyway, I was, I was very <laughs> no, pleased. No, but I it. loved it. It's a I... proper conspiracy, a proper conspiracy. Well, I do think it's important because I think it's so important to talk about exercise, but not, but not talking about it in a way that you can eat what you want and you can just run it off because I think that's also so misleading and that's where sometimes the no, narrative has weight got is to. weight is I would say 90 to 95 percent to do with your mm. what you put in your mouth and mm -hmm. maybe five to ten percent to do with your activity level mm -hmm. possibly even less mm -hmm. so we've gone through that it can be addictive we've gone through willpower doesn't exist we've gone through to look at the back of the labels to understand emuls emulsifiers flavors coloring can i say can i interrupt things. you willpower doesn't exist i think some listeners are going to be going well willpower does exist willpower <laughs> does not exist willpower is simply a function of your motivation and your opportunity and we know that if people have just loads of money and easy opportunities and all kinds of people sort of pushing them along they get loads of stuff done mm. so people with with money and resources and it's people who lack the financial ability to buy this food and who are surrounded by it and have it aggressively targeted at them so you you are completely right when you mm. say when you try and really study willpower and nail it down and go let's operationalize this and do a study on it it turns out not to exist it's a mm. proxy mainly for poverty mm -hmm. so people who sort of get a load of stuff done they're people who are born wealthy yeah and people who live in poverty actually they make really sensible decisions you know if, if you live in poverty taking opportunities when you can is a, is a smart thing to do it's so really tough. I, sorry i interrupted you no, but will, willpower does not exist but i love that i mean that's kind of something that i think a lot of people struggle with and they feel an immense amount of shame when they can't do it and yeah. that i think is really heartbreaking because it's not their fault and that's why i'm so passionate about self-compassion <laughs> but i think after all of this people are going to go okay well what's the solution because if we're all consuming ultra processed foods they're really addictive they're really tasty they're cheap they're easy our supermarket shelves are basically driven for us to choose these products what do we do how do i get out of this mess well, there, what... are two, there are two answers maybe there are three answers but there's a kind of answer for the individual and there's an answer for the for the individual as a voter i suppose or for for, for policymakers who may be listening so for someone who is listening, who is mm. feeling addicted to this food, mm. my proposal to them, and, and we have good evidence this works for cigarettes and for mm. some other things, is don't stop eating the food. Eat what you like, but do read about the food. And if you mm. can't afford my book, you can listen to the podcast. You can go mm. and read B. Wilson's article in The Guardian for free. You can, there's mm. loads of information now. Mm. Read your ingredients list and ask yourself the question, is this food or is it an industrially produced edible substance? 
And you may find that your relationship with it changes. If you, if you stop forbidding things, it's very interesting how if you allow yourself the treat and you really savour it, this isn't food that stands up to mm. scrutiny. For many people, they will, they, will, they will be able to make that journey. Lots of people aren't going to be able to afford to do that because mm. whilst lots and lots of politicians say, oh, well, it's very cheap to buy lentils or you just eat porridge. You know, in order to cook porridge, you need to um, be able to buy the milk and the saucepan and have a stovetop cooker, which many people don't have. You batch cook it, freeze some of it. Lots of people don't have a freezer. So porridge and lentils are expensive in time and money and and all the other stuff you have to add to them. Um, so if you can't do that, you need to make the journey from victim to activist. Mm. And what we need is to learn the lessons of tobacco control. In the 1980s, the biggest food companies in the world were owned by the two biggest tobacco companies in the world. So Philip Morris and RJ Reynolds bought uh, General Foods and Kraft and Nabisco. And they took all their marketing and flavor tech and they applied it to the foods. So we need to use the same set of uh, the same set of ideas, not the actual same policies, but the same tools to regulate the food industry. Mm. And the way we start is warning labels. So we've got very, very good evidence from South America that if you start with the warning label, big black stop signs, you know, if you go and buy a can of Coke in Argentina, it's got two very large octagons, bigger than the Coke logo, above the Coke logo, and two warning boxes about caffeine and colorings. Mm. And you then, once you've got warning labels on food, well, you then can't make a health claim on that food. You can't put a cartoon character on it. You can't sell it in a hospital or a prison or a school. You can't market it on television. And for the worst products, we could think about progressive taxation uh, and using that money to then uh, pay for reducing the, the price of real food and making things like broccoli and apples actually affordable because they are they are cripplingly expensive. Per, mm -hmm. per kilo, mm. broccoli is as expensive as meat. Mm. You know? And mm -hmm. it's hard to get kids to eat broccoli. I must say is, this yeah. is someone with kids. <laughs> so everyone has to be an activist. And I think there is there is real growing appetite for this and this mm. is what i've i've said to the house of lords and if you if you want to support this there are a couple of charities there's first steps nutrition nutrition and there's unicef and mm. both of those charities i work with to try and to change food policy um but but people should be be furious about this and mm. i'm i'm comfortable making people angry i think anger is a is a is a helpful emotion mm. i i I hope on that journey I'm not making too many people feel afraid mm. or disgusted. Maybe we should end by saying, you know, my kids eat a certain amount of ultra-processed food. Uh, it's not banned in my household. Mm. Um, I don't eat it because I don't want it. Mm. But don't don't kill yourself if you're, if you're really struggling. Mm. There are lots of other things you can do to maintain your health. And there's definitely a spectrum. Mm -hmm. So if you're eating an ultra-processed diet of you know, baked beans and whole grain bread and the odd fish finger, that's all fairly harmless stuff mm -hmm. probably. It's a bit mm -hmm. high in salt and sugar. Mm -hmm. I think the big kind of thing here is, isn't it, is that it's not just on that individual. It's not their fault that a lot of their diet is. Because a lot of people say, well, it's a choice. It's not a choice. And I think, I think that that sentence is so triggering when it's everyone has a choice. And I agree with you. We are in a hugely obesogenic food environment, massively. And we can be very misled. And I think the thing that I feel very protective about is the misled marketing. And it's very expensive. And people feel they want to spend their money to make themselves healthier. And actually, it's not doing that. And so I really hope that this podcast today has shed light on that. Your book has definitely shed light on that. And I have to ask the third, the next chapter that's coming in, because mm. you're about to bring this mm. out again. Mm. Can you talk to me about it? Oh, God, I've got to mention the paperback, I think. Uh, yeah. Um, well... So the book was published and everything was just amazing. For six months, I was in the newspapers every week. I was on every talk show and people were really, I think the British public were like, yeah, this makes sense. I've mm -hmm. been gaslit by my food. I can't lose lose weight. This is simple. And, um, you know, and I was in the bestseller charts. And then there was a press conference. And so my paperback follow-up chapter starts with a press conference and Five scientists stood up and they some of them worked for the government and they said there's nothing wrong with ultra processed food or or they said, you know, the concerns are overinflated um, and uh, people shouldn't be worried. And there's lots of healthy ultra processed food. And this is all more or less nonsense. And that made headlines um, all over the world. Now, 
well, I, I mean, I'll give a spoiler here because this was the this was the beginning of a very sustained effort by the food industry, who paid four out of the five scientists. Um, uh, one had been a senior scientist at Nestle for a decade. Um, and the press conference was hosted by something called the Science Media Centre, which is the sort of clearinghouse for lots of UK science journalism. The Science Media Centre is funded by Nestle, Procter & Gamble, who make Pringles, and a thing called Food, and Dr Food Drink Europe, which is partly funded by Coca-Cola. So what the chapter is trying to do is expose the extent to which our biggest food charity, the British Nutrition Foundation, their Healthy Eating Week in 2023 was sponsored by Coca-Cola. OK, so they're funded by McDonald's, by all the major supermarkets. We've then got the Science Media Centre funded by Nestle, Procter & Gamble, Coca-Cola and so on. Uh, we've then got the university research departments funded by uh, Pepsi and Mars. And they were some of the ones contributing the science scientists to the press conference. So... What I hoped is I'd get a row, I'd get my day in court with the CEO of Nestle. And that's not what happens. What you get is a covertly funded uh, someone who sounds very credible. They'll be a professor of nutrition somewhere and um, they are traducing me. And I think in the end, it's been rather fun exposing all this. And, and it was really enjoyable writing the chapter because... We then did an investigation in the British Medical Journal, did a load of freedom of information requests and exposed that everyone was funded by the food industry. So, I I mean, it's never more than a draw because mm. because these companies, are, you know, have... I mean, you've got to understand, when you're, when you're talking about companies like Nestle and Coca-Cola, they have uh, revenues that equal the GDPs of medium-sized countries, OK? If they, mm -hmm. if they were countries, they'd be in the top half of countries on mm. Earth, OK? That's how powerful they are. Mm. Um and so you're 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 really pushing rocks uphill, but I think we are seeing a move toward the kind of regulation mm -hmm. that I've spoken about. I'm so pleased you did that because in 2017 or was it 2019, I was at European Parliament talking about big food, big pharma, amazing, and exactly the same thing. Of course, and I mean that was six years ago, and it was a it was painful that fight to kind of bring it out and I think people are now listening I think we do know that we feel quite gaslit and I love that you use that word because it is gaslighting it feels that perhaps if there was only one thing to happen it would be that you know the first thing that happened with tobacco is tobacco money became dirty money mm. the charities stopped accepting it the scientists you know you'd never have the British Lung Foundation taking money from <laughs> Philip Morris why does the British Nutrition Foundation take money from Coca-Cola or McDonald's mm. even if you don't believe the science on ultra processed food we all agree that Coca-Cola McDonald's um, uh, you know and, and, and lots of the confectionery manufacturers are, are selling products that drive diet related disease mm -hmm. so it seems that ending the culture of conflicts of interest would be, to me, would be the number one thing. Mm. On the House of Lords committee I spoke to, there is the chief scientific advisor to Marks and Spencer, Lord Krebs. I mean, why is he on the committee? He shouldn't be there. You mm. can't mitigate that conflict. Mm. Uh, we see on the government's own scientific advisory committee on nutrition, 14 members, around half of them are funded by companies like and including Coca-Cola. I mean... So you, ha you have to end all this. You've got mm -hmm. to think of food has overtaken tobacco as the leading cause of early death globally. And we have to think of the companies that make this food as being similar in their incentives to tobacco companies. And mm -hmm. we cannot take their money. You can't solve a problem at the same time as you profit from creating yeah. it. I think that's kind of the leading remark, isn't it? the lasting remark. So the last thing I want to ask you, Chris, it's been so insightful and I hope it's just kind of opened so many of our listeners' eyes on what you've just said. It's definitely, I mean, honestly, your book was such an amazing read. And I'm going to link it into the show notes for everyone to go and buy when the new I chapter comes out. Much appreciated. But can I ask you the final question, which is, Chris, what does Live Well, Be Well mean to you? I think it's... F f I think I think about it. I, 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 I thought about this question quite hard on the way here. And for me... I think about it in the context of my kids, that my ability to enable them to um, live well and be well is pretty limited as a parent and their ability is very limited. And for me, it's about changing the, the, the structures around everyone, the environment, the marketing, the taxation, these sort of deep things that are quite invisible to us, but that dramatically affect our lives. And so uh, the, the, the current state of, of the UK and lots of other countries is it's quite violent to our bodies mm. in terms of the way traffic flows and air pollution, gambling ads, alcohol, vaping, tobacco and food. 
And to me, live well, be well needs to be about structural change and um, handing people, handing power back to people who are affected and diminishing the power of very large transnational corporations who often, frankly, don't pay much tax. So that's that's what it's about for me. It's about enabling people to do that and changing the environment around them. Mm -hmm. The activist approach that you mentioned earlier. Chris, thank you so much well, for such coming a pleasure. on. Thank you for having me.